Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for liking and subscribing. Do it right now. Get it out of the way. <laughs> subscribing is really important. So is liking um, the videos. It's really a marker um, to please the YouTube algorithms. But it is for us, our Sangha, a very important way to raise our uh, presence in the search results, which allows this resource, this portal to the re resource. Yes, this is a big resource. There's only a thousand videos on this channel, but um, it's also access and a reminder to access the threefoldlotus.com website and all the free information there, the bookstore, the mandala store. Yeah. Um, all of which helps to support this channel. So deep, deep appreciation for you for uh, watching, for practicing. And uh, for those of you who are able to send some financial uh, support this way, incredibly important. I've been uh, shopping, uh, looking for parts to build the ultimate video PC so that um, I'll secure uh, good quality videos for the future with your assistance. So thank you. All right. That's all the business. Uh, we are nearing the end of this, uh, this biography of Nitrin's life. Um, it's been a, uh, validating and informative, right? We've all heard aspects of Nitrin's life, but, uh, to read this, uh, over a century old writing, um, has had some interesting viewpoints in it uh, that help relate our lives to Nichiren. He is the one we emulate in our practice of Buddhism. Yes. Shakyamuni's teaching of the Lotus. Uh, yeah. So without further ado, let's continue. And um, I will do my best to keep at bay those elements that don't belong here, rhetorical elements, and just stick to the story. The Buddhist ideal of enlightenment is man's awakening to the fundamental unity of his present existence with the essential, the primeval, the timeless core of Buddhahood. While the key to make this world a hell or to transform it into a heaven is in our own hands. An interesting statement. I was just watching a video on uh, uh, the most recent uh, Blade Runner movie and how it mirrors our our modern societies, and uh, and we've I've talked about this before, um, you know the the search for identity, right? That samsaric drive to declare I am um, has become so much less heroic in modern times with I am being a reflection of what somebody else wants me to I am. Right? Uh, I am an employee. I am a representative of. Uh, there's lots of influences in our world today on uh, telling us what we should, could, would be. But uh, it seems all too absent uh, any teaching or discussion or movie or uh, existence that would promote our self discovery. Oh, plenty of things are heaped on us. Uh, everything from branding and, uh, uh, activities that are meant to promote self discovery, but they're just replacing self with a brand, an ideology, uh, you know, somebody else's version of what it is to be a complete human. Uh, self-discovery is self-discovery. It's within our own minds where we identify 
a purpose, uh, a sense of profound meaning, not just a meaning derived of somebody else's parameters. Even this language is difficult to describe what it is. I, I think that one of the few moments in our lives, in our modern lives, when we, when we scratch the surface of what it is to personally be is when we fall in love. There are moments when we fall in love, when we feel love, that the colorations, the the imposition of parameters from outside of us just kind of it's like our it's like going underwater we don't hear it so well we don't feel it so well. what we're con we're intensely aware of is this life of being i am so in love i don't i don't i can't see straight yeah and it's not the object of your love so much as this sensation overwhelming of your all your senses, right? You ever been in that kind of love? You might have to go all the way to your childhood to remember what that's like. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. I don't know what's happening lately. <clears throat> um. This, I believe, if you can consider that for a moment, is the very thing that Shakyamuni is talking about with Buddhahood. If you really know that sensation of living doesn't really require a self, does it? There's not an identification. Just, when you're in love, when you feel that those moments of being in love or love itself, however you describe it in myriad ways with myriad words, the sensation of it, it doesn't require language to say, I love. It's simply there in all of its manifestation. There's no need to identify it. That's like Buddhahood because it touches the essence of what it is to be alive. The full manifestation of this moment, this sensation, this witnessing, <gasps> ah, life. If you've ever witnessed the birth of your child, not somebody else's, but your own, that sensation, it comes, you come to it in a different way, but it's the same one. There are these precious moments in the lifespan of a human being where this sensation, to be, you become aware of the sensation I believe that's the same as awakening, enlightenment. That the artifice of everything else, is, it's still there, but it holds no sway in your mind outside of this experience. Yeah? So, you know, when the author says here, the fundamental unity of his present existence with the primeval Buddhahood. It's this force, this force isn't the right word. It's an embracing of life in its totality. If I were to tell you in that moment of overwhelming sensation that you're feeling the very energy that promotes or promotes, that drives this universe. I, I think you'd be in agreement. 
the moment you're out of that experience, you start, yeah, the whole universe over this, you know, maybe the, yeah, the words, the language, the adaptation to identification floods right back in. But I think in that moment where you're experiencing it, the light changes. Like I said, your hearing kind of dims. All external input shuts down into this tunnel vision of life. Yeah, you could see it, right? That's what this is saying. While the key to make this world a hell or to transform it into a heaven it's in our own hands. It's not really in our hands. That's metaphorical, of course. It's in our mind of perception, in the way we choose to experience life. With all of the noise all around us, money, relationships, jobs, whatever, habitat, food, on and on and on. We lose sight of the goal. We lose sight of life. And we try to substitute that sensation by collecting. Collecting approval. Collecting stuff. If I have this stuff, then my life will appear to be... <laughs> That's just a physical smokescreen we try to support ourselves with, and it actually detracts. It takes us away from what is our essential state of Buddhahood. Call it love. Call it intentional being. Right? In fact, that's the way I should adopt that terminology in the future. I just taught myself something. It's not just about being, but intentionally being. This is our opportunity as a human, samsaric, physical thing. The three bodies, remember? This manifest body to feel truly alive is to be in the flow of life itself, intentionally being all of what we can be, which is that loving, amazing experience of living, intentional being, namu myoho renge kyo, intentionally buddhaing. Hmm? The use of the key consists in first calling forth that Buddhahood in the innermost recesses of our experience, our life experience. And in viewing this actual world as the Buddha land. Yeah? When you experience that love, that falling in love, or that birth of that child, is there time? Is there, right? Even time disappears. This is the, when people ask me, how long should I chant? <laughs> I don't know. What I do know is that if you can raise the heart and mind of the experience of life, to your chanting, in your chanting, in your trance-like state of Buddhaness, then does it matter? If it takes you four hours to get there, or if it takes you 20 minutes to get there, getting there is the point. How long does that take? I don't know. Depends on your resolve. And we should all resolve 
to get to that point. Hmm? Because that's where life truly is. This transfiguration means not merely imagining that our samsaric life is Buddhahood, the pure land, but living in conformity with the assumption under the guidance of the enlightened mind. Isn't that what I'm talking about all the time? The more we reach that point, and I'll go back to the same tired example, when you fall in love, isn't the rest of your day, whether the object of your love is within view, doesn't matter anymore. You're just prancing along through life. Everybody deserves a smile. Everybody's wonderful. Everything is wonderful. Even what normally would maybe tear you down, like maybe an accident or, or whatever. You just go, <laughs> is that negativity wonderful? It doesn't, because it's not essential. It's just a footstep. Where I'm going is bliss, blissful, right? Because I'm living fully, unencumbered, unattached, unanchored. This ideal was realized by Shakyamuni Buddha when he preached the Lotus of Truth on Vulture Peak and the scene of the revelation was transfigured into a paradise. Nichiren had no doubt about this narrative. And now in Minobu, he was himself experiencing such a transfiguration in his own abode. Didn't matter that it was really cold or just the supreme gorgeous beauty, the air of the, the snow on the mountains, the babbling brook. We heard him talking about it, right? It's that sensation. Life itself, this process, it's utterly amazing. From that mental place, this is the Buddha land, yeah? But it's all about what? Attitude and intent. Intent because the intent is based on the attitude. Rather than satisfying all of these other little tripwires. Yeah, we may have to do that. But we can still see joy in all of those things. I've got to go to work. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Not with, I got to go to work. I got to make another buck. Attitude, intent. In expressing this conviction, he sometimes spoke, as we've seen, like a lyric poet. This comes natural, right? Because of the true nature of the process is poetic. It's, it's beyond the doldrums of language. It's more abstract and yet visceral. That's the wonderful thing about being a human being. We can mentally experience this abstraction of love, kind, amazing everythingness and embody it into sensations of sight, sound, taste, feeling, so on. We can incorporate it. Yet his poetry was never a mere play of fancy, but an earnest belief founded on the authority of the Lotus Sutra, as well as on his own experience, right? This is what we do when we chant. We take the guidance of Shakyamuni Buddha in the Lotus Sutra, and we embody it in this human being with our mind. Remember that Gohonzon portal in our mind and we instantiate it. That moment 
of profound engagement, living, Buddha-ness. Such was Nichiren's thought about the paradise on earth, or rather on the proposition that this very world is paradise to those minds illuminated by the truth of this abiding enlightenment, this process of life. This conception of the transfiguration of the world is very important for the understanding of Nietzsche's idea. Remember, earthly desires are enlightenment. That's where that comes from. The idea of this sangha, this like minds of instantiation of Buddhahood. And to make it still clearer, we may quote another passage from the dictated portions of his lectures on the lotus. Now, this is one of those argued things when we talk about what was written by others as they listened to Nietzsche's expositions. How was it written contemporaneously? Was it written later? Blah, 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 blah. But as I often say, the truth will out. Yeah. In the 16th chapter, so this is quoted from the, or quoted about the Lotus. It is said in the Lotus Sutra, quote, at that time I shall appear on Vulture Peak together with my congregation, end quote. Here time, quote unquote, means the age of the latter day of the law. When the spiritual communion between us and Buddha shall be realized. I means Shakyamuni, with the Bodhisattvas, congregation, the community of Buddha's disciples, together implies the ten realms of existence and Vulture Peak is the land of serene light. Basically repeating what I've been talking about. Appear means to make a manifestation at Vulture Peak, while Vulture Peak means the manifestation of enlightenment. That is the abode of Nietzsche's followers who utter the adoration of the Lotus of Truth. Those of us who chant, invoke, myoho renge kyo, with our very essence, our complete life experience, namu, myoho renge kyo, we are invoking our Buddha-ness, our in love, that's why adoration. We are invoking that experience of total life in clarity, in Buddha-ness. Any place where men practice the resolve of the one vehicle of invocation, of adoration, the adoration of the lotus of truth. There is the castle of the eternal serene light, which is Vulture Peak. Vulture Peak being the conceptual mental space of the Lotus Sutra, the ceremony in the sky, if you will. Hmm? That is the experience, the exalted experience of living life. Hmm? Yet the primeval entity of the Ultra Peak is nowhere else than in this very Saha world. Especially in Japan, the land of the sunrise, the Saha world furnished with the perfection of the primeval stage where the lotus of truth is to be realized in our sentient minds, right here and now. It's not some far-off place, not some old scripture. It's a right here and now experience. All it requires is your dedicated, focused mind to be it, to be fully alive. No boundaries.
The Saha world furnished with the perfection of the primeval stage where the lotus of truth is to be realized, the place where the unique mandala will be revealed and established, the mandala embodying the primeval import of what is taught in the chapter of the life duration, the lifetime of the Tathagata, or the eternal life of the Tathagata. That's this representation. That's what the mandala is. It's not the Gohanzan. It's the representation, the object of focus to turn our minds inward to the Buddha land, the pure land, the loving, full expression of living life. Everything else is just ephemeral. It's samsara. That's okay. But it's not life. Your life. The author continues, where there lives a true Buddhist, there is manifest in his spirit and life the mandala the cycle embodying the cosmic truth. Now, the illusion that the author is making is that this object of focus is the manifest Buddha life, the, the manifest body. The reward is something experienced in the mind by tapping into the Dharma, the truth, that process of life so we have a mandala to remind us to point our senses our samsaric senses listening to our chanting uttering our chanting the rhythm the sensation and our eyeballs at this truth this mandala that describes proscribes reflects the concept in that teaching of that truth. But we don't experience it in the mandala. It's just a tool. We experience it in our own mind. That's where the Gohonzon is. That's where that portal, that falling in love is. Hmm? A natural corollary to this idea is that the whole realm of existence ought to be the stage of this realization. But Japan, where the prophet of this doctrine, this teaching, has appeared, should be the center of the kingdom of Buddha. It should be. The man has appeared and the stage is determined. A definite organization must now be provided for actually effecting the transformation according to the instructions given by the prophet. This idea gradually crystallized in Nichiren's mind into a definite plan for establishing the center of this universal teaching. The, the seat of promotion, identifying samsaric place of discovery and learning the kaidan to not only teach but to hold in primary esteem this buddhaness this portal to be achieved the kaidan like our butsudan is a is a construct of a kaidan around the concept in the envisioned in the mandala of Buddhahood. But these are all samsaric reminders, right? He had cherished this idea since his days in Sado, and he expressed it, as we have seen, the first writing after his retirement. More definite expression was given it in, quote, the perpetuation of the three great Secrets, remember they're called secrets oftentimes. Which he wrote on the 8th of the 4th month, April 27th, 
the day believed to be the birthday of Shakyamuni Buddha in uh, uh, he wrote this letter in 1281, the year before his death. It is also interesting to notice that this year was made memorable by the remarkable prediction Nietzsche made to his followers concerning the threatening Mongol invasion. Of this prediction, we shall speak later. The treatise on the three secrets begins with a question. What is meant by the following passage in the chapter 21 on the powers of the Tathagata, yeah? Quote, in fine, all the truths possessed by the Tathagata, all the, what are they called oftentimes? Not mysterious. They're called supernatural powers. Under the control of the Tathagata, all the stocks of Mystery, uh, mysteries cherished by the Tathagata, all the profound things in the hands of the Tathagata, all and every one of these have been revealed and proclaimed in this teaching, the Lotus Sutra. This is the famous legacy entrusted to the keeping of the leaders of the Bodhisattvas and the other Bodhisattvas of the earth. It had been explained in various ways by Nietzsche's predecessors, but he interpreted it to mean nothing but the three secrets entrusted to himself and destined to be fulfilled in the latter days, in his day, at his time. His interpretation was this. All truths, mysteries, etc. are actuated by the personality of the Tathagata. While the Tathagata is a perfect being because he is furnished with the three aspects of personality, the three bodies, right? Manifest, reward, dharma. These three aspects are, oh, here we go, the metaphysical entity dharmakaya, which is represented in Nichiren's doctrine in the Bodhisattva, or, um, Buddha Ness, yeah? The supreme being, or the mandala, Met, uh, represented in the mandala. The blissful manifestation, Sambhogakaya, chiefly consisting in intellectual enlightenment, which is represented by the sacred title, Myohorengekyo. And the actual manifestation, Nirmanakaya, the realization of Buddha's life, which is to be established and organized in the kaidan, the, the embodiment, the sacred place of initiation, the manifest. The manifest body is where the experience of, the reward of this truth of the process of life is to occur. We are all three. And when we sit in front of our butsudan and chant with our focus on that mandala, we are speaking to ourselves, awakening this profound, loving, it's bigger than that word, this total experience of life existing moment to moment, being in the engine of life. Hmm? Of these three, the first two had already been revealed by Nietzsche, and now the foundation of the third was to be laid. He writes this as follows, quote, When at a certain future time the union of the state law and the Buddhist truth shall be established, and the harmony between the two completed, both sovereign and subjects will faithfully Adhere to the great three secrets. Yeah. The law, the place where the law is practiced, and the situation, the, 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 the kaidan, the place of practice, right? The three bodies again.
both sovereign and subject. Then the golden age, such as were the ages under the reign of the sage kings of old, will be realized in these days of degeneration and corruption. In the time of the latter day, or the latter law. Then the establishment of the Sangha will be completed by imperial grant and the edict of the dictator. Dictator? That's uh, certainly uh, owing to uh, the state of affairs uh, in medieval Japan. Uh, dictator. The, the ruler, I suppose. At a spot comparable in its excellence with the paradise of Vulture Peak. We have only to wait for the coming of the time. Then the moral law will be achieved in the actual life of mankind. The experience of Buddhahood will then be the seat where all men of the three countries, India, China, and Japan, and the whole Jampudvipa world will be initiated into the mysteries of the secrets of confession and expiation, and even the great deities Brahma and Indra will come down into the sanctuary and participate in the initiation. And he's talking in reference with where he is in Minobu. He's establishing the seat of his doctrine in Minobu. Not Fuji, in Minobu. The author continues, although Nichiren expressed his idea about the time and place of the establishment of the Kaidan, thus uh, vaguely, he was sure that it would come to pass, and it is related that he dispatched the ablest of his disciples to the fo foot of uh, Fuji to select the spot for it. Now that's an interpretation that's under contention, right? As I've already uh, mentioned. Whatever truth there may be in this legend, his conception of the, the temple, the kaidan, was at the same time ideal and concrete. In the ideal, he has esteemed every place. See, this is the only place where we ever see that crop up. So obviously, even then, th this writer in, at Harvard in uh, the early 1900s, the transition between the 19th and 20th century, wrote this, that influence was still present, right? You know, 700 years before him. Uh, <clears throat> In the ideal, he esteemed every place where his doctrine should be practiced as a paradise. So wherever, more to the point, this doctrine of Namu Myo and Geikyo would be practiced is the Kaidan. Because the three bodies, right? The, uh, the Kaidan embraces all beings. And it stages the whole cosmos. Once again, reiterating. But on the other hand, the center was to be definitely established in a place considered to be peculiarly the source of light and life in Nietzsche's own country. Thus, he combined his ideal paradise with the universal Kaidan and spent his days of retirement and silent meditation for the fulfillment of his project. It is no wonder, then, that he pronounced Minobu to be an earthly paradise and yet planned for the propagation of, it, of his doctrine throughout the world. So, why that one sentence... I think the, it's obvious that the author was probably forced to include that because of the, the prominence or the, the political influence of the Fuji schools. But as we know, that was only one of the disciples who actually disagreed and fought with the other of the six core disciples and took off on his own to promulgate Nietzsche's doctrine in his own view, in a very religious way, where the others stayed and radiated from Minobu with Nietzsche's teachings. But often in the West, we're given, just like this author was forced to, to idealize the Fuji school above all else, but that, that was a splinter group. 
It's very obvious as we read this. Why all of a sudden, boop, that pops up out of nowhere. And then recedes rather quickly as he continues to talk about Nietzsche and establishing his teaching from Mount Minobu. It's amazing the way po politics and manipulations occur constantly. And language is the vehicle, right? So this next chapter titled Silent Meditation and Anxious Watching, we will begin in the next video. Um... In the meantime, I hope you found something in this, or you continue to find something in this uh, reading of this author's biography of Nietzsche that uh, mostly, I think for me, renews my sense of identification with Nietzsche, right? Ultimately, each one of us is a Nietzschean. Each one of us is a Bodhisattva who is seeking primarily to embody that experience, that total experience of being, living completely, fully, without restriction, sensing life, the totality of life, the falling in love with life, being. Yeah, with that kind of mind. Then proceed through samsara, this wonderful frolicking experience of physical life with this mind of profound appreciation and awe. At all of it. Happy or sad, good or bad, whatever other language you want to wrap around, it's all amazing. Right? Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your practice. Please take care of your health. Be kind to yourself. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now. Oh.